The word of the Lord comes to us today from Exodus chapters 30 and 31. You shall make an altar on which to burn incense. You shall make it of acacia wood. A cubit shall be its length and a cubit its breadth. It shall be square and two cubits shall be its height. Its horn shall be of one piece with it. You shall overlay it with pure gold, its top and around its sides and its horns. And you shall make a molding of gold around it. And you shall make two golden rings for it. Under its molding, on two opposite sides of it, you shall make them, and they shall be holders for poles with which to carry it. You shall make the poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. And you shall put it in front of the veil that is above the ark of the testimony, in front of the mercy seat that is above the testimony, where I will meet with you. And Aaron shall burn fragrant incense on it. Every morning when he dresses the lamps, he shall burn it. And when Aaron sets up the lamps at twilight, he shall burn it. A regular incense offering before the Lord throughout your generations. You shall not offer unauthorized incense on it or a burnt offering, or a grain offering, and you shall not pour a drink offering on it. Aaron shall make atonement on its horns once a year. With the blood of the sin offering of atonement, he shall make atonement for it once in the year throughout your generations. It is most holy to the Lord. The Lord said to Moses, When you take the census of the people of Israel, then each shall give a ransom for his life to the Lord when you number them that there shall be no plague among them when you number them. Each one who is numbered in the census shall give this, half a shekel according to the shekel of the sanctuary, the shekel is 20 geras, half a shekel as an offering to the Lord. Everyone who is numbered in the census from 20 years old and upward shall give the Lord's offering. The rich shall, give, shall not give more and the poor shall not give less than the half shekel when you give the Lord's offering to make atonement for your lives. You shall take the atonement money from the people of Israel and shall give it for the service of the tent of meeting, that it may bring the people of Israel to remembrance before the Lord, so as to make atonement for your lives. The Lord said to Moses, You shall also make a basin of bronze, with its stand of bronze for washing. You shall put it between the tent of meeting and the altar, and you shall put water in it, for, with, for which Aaron and his sons shall wash their hands and their feet. When they go into the tent of meeting or when they come near the altar to minister to burn a food offering to the Lord, they shall wash with water so that they may not die. They shall wash their hands and their feet so they may not die. It shall be a statute forever to them, even to him and to his offspring throughout their generations. The Lord said to Moses, Take the finest spices of liquid myrrh, 500 shekels, and of sweet-smelling cinnamon, half as much, that is, 250, and 250 of aromatic cane, and 500 of cassia, according to the shekel of the sanctuary, and a hin of olive oil. And you shall make of these a sacred anointing oil blended as by the perfumer. It shall be a holy anointing oil. With it, you shall anoint the tent of meeting and the ark of the testimony, and the table and all its utensils, and the lampstand and its utensils, and the altar of incense." and the altar of burnt offering with all its utensils and the basin and its stand. You shall consecrate them, that they may be most holy. Whatever touches them will become holy. You shall anoint Aaron and his sons and consecrate them, that they may serve me as priests. And you shall say to the people of Israel, This shall be my holy anointing oil throughout your generations. It shall not be poured on the body of an ordinary person, and you shall, and you shall make no other like it in, in its composition. It is holy, and it shall be holy to you. Whoever compounds any like it or whoever puts any of it on an outsider shall be cut off from his people. The Lord said to Moses, Take sweet spices, staccate and anica and galbamon, sweet spices with pure frankincense, of each shall there be an equal part, and make an incense blended as by the perfumer, seasoned with salt, pure and holy. You shall beat some of it very small, and put part of it before the testimony in the tent of meeting, where I shall meet with you. It shall be most holy for you. And the incense that you shall make according to its composition, you shall not make for yourselves. It shall be for you holy to the Lord. Whoever makes any like it to use as perfume shall be cut off from his people. The Lord said to Moses, 
See, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And I have filled him with the spirit of God, with ability and intelligence, with knowledge and all craftsmanship, to devise artistic designs, to work in gold, silver, and bronze, in cutting stones for setting and in carving wood, to work in every craft. And behold, I have appointed with him Aholiab, the son of Ahishamach, of the tribe of Dan. And I have given to all able men ability that they may make all I have commanded you, the tent of meeting and the ark of the testimony and the mercy seat that is on it and all the furnishings of the tent, the table and its utensils and the pure lampstand with all its utensils and the altar of incense and the altar of burnt offering with all its utensils and the basin and its stand and the finely worked garments, the holy garments for Aaron the priest and the garments of his sons for their service as priests and the anointing oil and the fragrant incense for the holy place. According to all that I have commanded you, they shall do. And the Lord said to Moses, you are to speak to the people of Israel and say, above all, you shall keep my Sabbaths for this is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I, the Lord, sanctify you. You shall keep the Sabbath because it is holy for you. Everyone who profanes it shall be put to death. Whoever does any work on it, that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of solemn rest, holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath day shall be put to death. Therefore, the people of Israel shall keep the Sabbath, observing the Sabbath throughout their generations as a covenant forever. It is a sign forever between me and the people of Israel that in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. And he gave to Moses when he had finished speaking with him on Mount Sinai the two tablets of the testimony, tablets of stone written with the finger of God. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. I love, love, love hearing those long bits of scripture <laughs> read before service. You know, uh, we have some wonderful readers, and uh, thank you for doing that. I know it was a little bit long this morning. So. All right. Shall we begin with prayer this morning? We're going to pray from... Uh, Psalm 62, the beginning part of it. Father, we just come before you uh, humble, Lord, by who you are. Lord, thankful for you, who you are, Lord. And your word says, Lord, that uh, for God alone my soul waits in silence. For him, from him comes my salvation. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be greatly shaken. Father, we pray that... Uh, as we go through today's text and as we walk through the days of our lives, Lord, that we wouldn't be shaken. We would know that um, the foundation is on Christ, that we would continue to come back to Christ and that he would be glorified through all of it. We love you so much, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The wonder of memories. Memories, they're beautiful things. How emotional they can be. My earliest memory is being on the shores of Corpus Christi as a two-year-old with my hands up and my parents lifting me up over every wave that came onto shore. And it was a long time ago, 45 years this summer to be exact. <laughs> but I still remember the laughing and the joy and the smell of the water. And it is, it's a short memory, and even though I continue to remember it, it's shrinking bit by bit every year that I get older. You see, often we forget so much. We can forget the things that are so very important to us, things that we see daily in our lives. We can forget. Here's a couple of examples. All right, think back. Do you remember the combination to your lock on your first locker? 
Yes. Wow. Who else? <laughs> I don't. <laughs> All right. What about uh, those people, no names, who, who lose their keys? Oh, <laughs> we totally made that up. We set that up, by the way. <laughs> I'm someone who loses my keys all the time. Or, finally, how many of you know the name or the names of your grandparents' grandparents? Wasn't that many generations ago. Some of us may even have pictures. You see, our, our circumstances and to-do lists can often take us away or distract us enough just to overlook that which should be remembered. And in today's text, it would appear that the Lord would want us to remember him. And he wants us to continue to remember him not only through this generation, but through all the generations. So I think a good question to ask ourselves as we get into this text, even brothers and sisters, those of you who have been following the Lord for many years, the question is simply this, how can we remember God through our generation and the generations to come? We're going to have several more points in today's sermon than we normally would. It's a sizable text and we're going to try to cover it. Uh, we're going to have five points this morning. If you are the kind of person that writes those things down, let us begin. <laughs> Point number one will be the, the bronze lavier or labor. Number two will be the altar of incense. Three, anointing oil and fragrances. Four, contributions. And five, the Sabbath rest. All right. Well, please note that as we're going through today's text, we are going to be jumping around a little bit. It's not going to go directly all the way beginning at 30 and all the way through 31. It's going to be moving around a bit. But I really believe that the order on the path to holiness matters. And I think God's word continues to, to illustrate that to us. So let's re review the bronze or brazen altar. Now, this is the altar that Israel sees as they're ent entering the gates for the tabernacle. So the first thing that they're going to see, it's right in front of them. And this is an altar that sin gets atoned for. This is the altar that they had to bring a male animal without blemish, without spots, and they would bring it to the front gate. The tr sin would be transferred to it, and then the animal slaughtered and burnt. You see, the wages of sin are death, and death has to occur to atone for sin. It's necessary. So before we can even move in the direction of fellowship with God, <coughs> sin has to be dealt with. Can you imagine the multitude of animals that had to be sacrificed? Tons and tons. How dirty was that job? So now we come to the bronze basin, and this is a basin for cleansing. The temple lever is, as it was known, uh, is a, a place right outside between the tent of meeting and the brazen altar, and this was to cleanse the priests after that very dirty job of sacrifice that occurred at the brazen altar. The hands and the feet of the priests were to be washed before they proceeded any further. Now there's some wonderful depictions of, of the bronze basin. There's this really beautiful one with this round bowl of water, but there's also this, this bowl on the bottom that, that everything sits in and the feet get cleansed as well and the hands. You see, even the priests who are set apart for God's work must not enter the temple uncleansed. God is a holy God. 
then that what stains a person cannot be allowed to enter the holy places of God. At Music Around, the store that I worked at for many years, we had a remodel that occurred in, in 2010. And we decided that it was a wonderful time since we were building stuff to replace the carpet. Now, if you've been in that store, you'll know that the, at the very back of the store, there's these two black double doors. Well, about a week after we replaced the carpet, we looked at the doors and said, golly, those things are really scratched up. Maybe we should repaint them. So one of our employees began to do that. They got out the paint, they opened the door slightly and began painting. Well, inadvertently, another employee came in to check her schedule and she didn't know that there was a can of paint behind the door. She opened the door and spilled the paint. Now, this would have been fine because this is in the back room where the offices are and some overstock, right? Like, no big deal. Nobody sees it. However, when she walked back out to leave after checking her schedule, she inadvertently stepped in the black paint. And there you have it. On the floor were about 12 footsteps in black on gray, light gray carpet. I almost died. <laughs> I, was, I was terrified. But you know, we scrubbed and scrubbed and scrubbed. This is enamel paint. We scrubbed those spots and they never came out. They lessened a little bit. We decided to kind of put stuff over the top of them, you know, like, oh yeah, we'll just put this big, huge speaker cabinet over here. But they never came out. Eventually we had to replace the carpet yet again. And so is the stain the sin of stain, brothers and sisters. Try as you may, this stain cannot be removed or scrubbed away by us. It takes one greater to do the job. Scripture tells us that when we are redeemed, we are a new creation, cleansed. And we can't enter into fellowship with God with sin present. We must be covered by the blood of Christ, the perfect and sinless one. Romans 3, 25 and 26 says this, Whom God put forth as propitiation for his blood to be received by faith, this was the show to show God's righteousness. Because of his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and justifier of the one who has faith. In Jesus. And we also see another picture of this in John 13, 3 through 9. Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper, lay aside his outer garments, and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, you, do you wash my feet? And Jesus answered him, What I am doing, you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. And then Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. And Jesus answered, If I do not wash you, you have no share with me. And then Peter replied, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Isn't it amazing in God's economy that this picture of Jesus Christ's blood spilt is what cleanses us. As we take on that covering, we become pure and spotless, white as snow. That which we've walked on and touched and exposed ourselves sinfully to. So we've seen this picture of the bronze lavere. Now we move to the altar of incense. The altar of incense.
A cubit its length and width, and two cubits its height. It's overlaid with gold and has four horns on each corner. Now, this is the altar that stands just before the veil that conceals the Holy of Holies. And the incense to be burned on the altar is to be burned in the morning and at the end of the day. And there cannot be unauthorized incense burned on it. No other burnt offerings, no grain offerings, no drink offerings. And once a year, Aaron shall make atonement on its horns with the blood of the sin offering. And the word says this should occur throughout the generations. Now, when incense is mentioned here and anywhere in the Bible, it's, it's referring to prayer. It's the lifting up of prayer. And God receives those prayers as a sweet aroma. I'm reminded of Revelation 5.8 describing those large golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Yet, my brothers and sisters, we risk our prayers not being heard. When we idolize something outside of God and we have in our hearts disobedience, secret sin, indifference, neglect of mercy, despising the law, blood guiltiness, iniquity, stubbornness, self-indulgence, the list goes on and on, we begin to put up a barrier for God hearing our prayers. And my brother and I would just call you where you're at. If you're in a spot, repent, come back to the Lord, come back to Jesus. But I also want to note the daily frequency of burning of the incense, morning and night, morning and night. And while I don't think that this is a model for how we're supposed to do it, I, I think it really conveys a range for us more than those actual specific times, as in day and night, as in never ceasing, as 1 Thessalonians 5.17 says. To continually bring to God our prayers, to ask him to enter into our lives, into our issues, into the things that are going on. Again, this is a sweet aroma to him. Yet there is a better picture of prayer through Christ Jesus. It's in Hebrews 7, 25. It says this, Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. This is Jesus praying for you, believer, brother and sister in Christ. This is Jesus praying for you continually. There's intercessory prayer on your behalf by the Savior. That is amazing. Yet, isn't it interesting that as people, sinful people, prayer is one of the hardest things to do on a daily basis, is it not? I struggle every day to get into prayer. How do I do that? What do I say? What do I, what do I need to pray about? There's, you know, I have kids that are hungry in the morning they get up and like, Dad, what's for breakfast? So we're making breakfast. We're trying to figure things out. And I'll begin to neglect that prayer. But I think taking those times of prayer, setting aside those times, are, are absolutely necessary. It's relationship. It's that relationship with Jesus. And especially that relationship that, that Ron talked about in the call to worship. It's an invitation. One of the ways that I, I typically will uh, enter into prayer is just praying through the Psalms. Just pray through the Psalms. Often we see the lamenting of the situation and then we see the psalmist rejoice at the end in who God is and what he's doing. So we've seen this newer picture of Jesus who intercedes for us. And now we're going to move to oils and fragrances. Oils and fragrances. Now this anointing oil made of these rare and wonderful uh, items 
right? And, and to be refined by a, a perfumer, is, it's, it's considered to be holy. This is a holy, this is a holy substance. And they also use it to anoint the tent, the ark, the tables, the utensils, the lampstands, the altar of incense, and the altar of burnt offerings and its utensils. And it's not to just be poured out or thrown upon people. It's to be considered holy. And it's not to be copied or used outside of the temple. This anointing oil typically signifies blessing and bounty and the setting apart of holy things for purposes of the Lord. The fragrances of the incense made, again, really rare substances that they bring together and are refined by a perfumer. And it is meant to be burnt in front of the ark of testimony in the tent of meeting. And it was also considered to be very holy because it was used where the Lord would meet with people. It should also be stated that th those who burned incense or used the anointing oil in an unworthy manner were severely punished. You see, the preparation of priests and the preparation of that which is holy was to be taken not lightly, but taken seriously. This isn't just a job of, of showing up and getting it done. Oh, yeah, I'll just show up and, yeah, we'll just uh, we'll, we'll do whatever the Lord wants us to do in, in the temple. No, you were appointed and you were anointed in all of these things. And the, the priests were the people who were ordained by God. They're to offer sacrifice of sin, to set apart. They're set apart in the, from the tribe of Levi. And they were to offer gifts and represent the people before God. They taught the law. They determined whether a person was sick or healthy. So you see, from the incense twice daily, to the cleansing of the priest before entering the tent, to the anointing oil used to anoint not only the altars and all of their implements, but to also anoint and set apart the priests. These things are important to God. It's that picture of, of being clean and cleansed before God, to being set apart before God. When we purchased our first crib for Elliot, and if you know me, I'm, I'm pretty handy. I, I figured that I didn't need the instructions for this thing. <laughs> so we began to assemble. And I told Gina, I got this, honey. Why don't you go, go sit down, it's fine. <laughs> and so uh, an hour later, after fiddling and uh, messing around with this crib, I ended up stripping several of the screws. And the side rail, you know that one that's supposed to come down so you can go grab the baby? It wouldn't even fit. <laughs> and it was in that moment that I pondered whether I had compromised its integrity and its purpose. And I think that's what God is calling people here to, is to take heed of what he sees as, as worthy worship, not to bring these other things in, not to be used outside of worship of God, not to idolize others, but is intended for God and God alone. And I think that's why God gives this instruction. Because the priests were the ones meeting with, with God. Yet in today's, in today's time, brothers and sisters in Christ, you are the priests. You are the priests. Here's what Exodus 19, 5 and 6 state. It's just a couple of chapters ago. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all people. For all the earth is mine. This is verse 6. 
and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. We are to be priests in this kingdom, in this holy nation for God and his glory. Brothers and sisters, you have this picture of Jesus as our high priest. He's prepared himself, and we ought to do the same, preparing ourselves daily for fellowship with God, not only now, but throughout the generations. So we've talked about the preparation of the priests, and now let's move to the contribution of the people. God also requires that we not only prepare ourselves for fellowship with him, but it requires a contribution to his work from his people. Now, don't miss this. He, he doesn't need you. He doesn't need your contribution. But this is part of, a, of the invitation to be in his will. This is part of the sanctification process as we grow, as we learn. And this also begins to change the desires of our heart. You see, our souls don't prosper, they don't grow, they don't get strengthened when we're dedicated to our own selfish needs. However, when we use our financial and get and the gifts that God has given us, our talents for God's glory, he will often multiply and grow his kingdom through those means. Verse 11, uh, a census is to be given, or I'm sorry, to be taken in. Each person, a ransom given for his life to the Lord. And every person who is counted should give a half a shekel according to this, the shekel of the sanctuary. Everyone aged 20 and older shall give this offering. The rich one shall give no more, and the poorer shall give no more. You see, God doesn't see the rich man as more important. We are all on the same plane, brothers and sisters. It is God and us sinners. Now, this, this half shekel isn't an extreme amount of money, right? It's, it's roughly the equivalent of two days' wages, but the intention of, of the of the contribution was to upkeep and and maintain the temple. And we're called to do that. We're called to, to help with those kingdom purposes. And then we get to Oholiab and Bezalel, chapter 31, verse 1. The Lord says to Moses, the Lord said to Moses, this is the fifth time, if you're following, if you've read through the text, this is the fifth out of six times that it was said. Thirty-one, verse one. The Lord said to Moses, "See, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, and I have filled him with the Spirit of God." with abilities and intelligence, with knowledge and all craftsmanship, to devise artistic design, to work in gold, silver, and bronze, in cutting stone for setting, and in carving wood, to work in every craft. Now, these are my kind of guys, right? These guys are, they're craftsmen. They, they love to build. That's what God has given them talent for doing. You know, I'm, I'm a tinkerer by nature. And very often, you can ask my wife, there's always like two or three projects on my work desk in the garage. 
But I'm, almost, I'm also a finishing guy. Like I really love, I've finished several instruments at our house where you actually apply the lacquer to the outside. And it's a super time consuming process. But if you do it right, it looks great. And it's funny because when I finish a project like that, when I'm working on something, I often, as Eric Liddell, whom the movie uh, Chariots of Fire is about, he says, I feel God's pleasure in that. And I got to say, I do too. I love working on stuff. Can you imagine the joy of the people that are working on the tabernacle? Right? It's not, it's not necessary for them to do it, but they are contributing to it. They are contributing to God's will, to God's word being, being set forth, to God's glory. What joy! But notice it is the Spirit of God who gives this ability. He gives the ability, intelligence, knowledge, and craftsmanship to devise artistic design. Skip down to the second half of verse 6. Given all able men that they may make all the things I have commanded you. Yet we see that Jesus is the better picture of this, right? He is the grand architect. He's the builder and sustainer of all things. John 1 says this, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things, catch this, all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Brothers and sisters, nothing is wasted. Nothing is wasted in the hands of God. Many are called to contribute their gifts in the building and, and maintenance of the temple. And you all are called to contribute your gifts for God's kingdom purposes. I look out and I see amazing people who can do things that a lot of other people can't do. What a tremendous blessing that is. Contribute those gifts. Grow the kingdom through those gifts. Again, this is that picture of our Savior. Uh, um, it's a reflection of Him, our gifts. And it should be more apparent day by day as we become, as we become more conformed to the image of Christ. And these are some ways that we can continue to remember God throughout our generations. We can draw near to him with those gifts. Next, we're going to move to the observation of Sabbath. This is a Sabbath that brings peace. God reiterates the Sabbath yet again here from chapter 20 and 23 of Exodus but with a little bit more detail and explanation. And the Lord said to Moses, You are to speak to the people of Israel and say, Above all, you shall keep my Sabbath, for this is a sign between you and me throughout the generations, there's that phrase again, that you may know that I, the Lord, sanctify you. And let us also take note that the text says, Not observing the Sabbath is punishable by death. The Sabbath is a sign that these people, the Israelites, that they indeed belong to the Lord. And they, they mirror the work of their Creator and the rest of the Creator as well. Taking that seventh day to rest. And what beautiful intention the Lord had through that because it also allowed those around them to rest, to let the animals rest. But this ultimately points to a freedom from slavery by Egypt. Slaves do not have a day of rest.
Praise God that he's built into us this need for rest and refreshment. It is this dependence on him that is signified here as this solemn rest. And how wonderful and merciful God is to give us that rest. And to consequently give those around us rest. Yet, our rest on this earth is temporal. It's temporal. Tonight you will go to bed, you will sleep, tomorrow you will wake up, you will work again, and you'll repeat that for the entirety of your days. Is that rest? Is that rest? And the Sabbath spoken of here is is really that picture of heavenly rest, of eternal rest. It's the, the rest that we find only in Christ Jesus. You see, it's Christ that will divide the believer and the non-believer on that day of atonement. Brothers and sisters, you believe in a Savior that is mighty to save, who did live a sinless life, who did die on the cross as a propitiation for our sins, who did rise again from the death as conqueror of death and sin. And as you can see from the earlier parts that we talked about, God cannot have fellowship with sin. Atonement is required. Cleansing is required. And it's through Jesus that we can come into fellowship with God. And it is our response as redeemed people to lift up prayer to our God, to rest in the finished work of Jesus, to rest in the finished work of Jesus to rest in the finished work of Jesus. That eternal rest of perfection. No more sin. No more sickness. No more sadness. No more division. Only the perfection of God. But if you are here and you have yet to profess a saving faith in Jesus, my friend, May I plead with you. We don't know the numbers of our days. We don't. Our brother Dan passed away this this last Thursday. Three or four years ago when they were, Dan and Jan were here at at church, we we couldn't have foreseen when that was going to happen. Yet he is in, he is in glory with God right now. He is in that place of rest. But my friend, those without Christ Jesus as their their assurance, there's a place for those people. You see, we have condemned ourselves with our sin to an eternity of separation from God. To be in a place called hell. Remember, the price of sin is death. Yet, if you hear his voice, if you feel that prompting in your spirit, today, today is the day of salvation. You too, my friend, can have that everlasting life, that assurance of an eternity with God. Perfect peace, perfect rest, perfect fellowship. If you're here today and you have not proclaimed Christ as your Savior, any of our elders would love to pray with you, love to talk to you, love to work with you through that to see what that means. Brothers and sisters, we are finite. And thankfully so, I am so tired right now, I didn't sleep a wink last night. (laughs) Yet God in his mighty wisdom created conditions that require that we rest. And this rest really resides in eternity. Tonight I'll go home, I'll sleep, and I'll probably feel better tomorrow. Yet my striving, my attempts at rest without Christ 
don't ever bring rest or peace. It's through the finished work of Jesus. But I think the Sabbath is also just another great opportunity for us to be well seeped in, in God, in the scriptures, in prayer, in fellowship with God. And for those of us that are raising children, this is a great opportunity for us to model for future generations that picture of what it means to remember God, to revere Him, and to love Him. Brothers and sisters, you are indeed a kingdom of priests. These pictures that come through all of the the furniture in the tabernacle are really pictures of Christ. It's His work. But they're pictures that help us remember that we can remember what he's done in our lives and throughout the generations. Jesus is our atonement and our cleansing. Our response is to be set apart, (coughs) to invite God into our lives through prayer, and to rest in the peace that only Christ can offer. God gave us these pictures as a way to remember him and to remember what he has done in our lives. In 1995, a second year student at the prestigious Massachusetts Institute of Technology, otherwise known as MIT, developed an algorithm for combining smaller photographs to create a much bigger picture. This process is called a a, a photo mosaic. You probably have seen them. Robert Silvers not only created the algorithm, but he also patented it in 1997. And this process requires a large amount of photographs. We can see some of the photographs here. Many photographs to pull from to make a greater image. And that's exactly what God's done with the Old Testament. Everything that you find in the Old Testament is pointing forward to the Savior, the Messiah, Christ Jesus. It all points to Him. It's the sufficiency of Jesus, the birth, the life, the death, and the resurrection, and His long-awaited return. Jesus is our remembrance. Jesus is our work. Jesus is our rest. As we conclude today, go ahead and play the video. This is a photo mosaic, and those smaller pictures point to the Savior. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you that, Lord, you have not just uh, left us in the wilderness, Lord, but uh, through your word, Lord, through uh, your revelation, Lord, we get to know you and we get to... uh, be in fellowship with you, Lord, through Christ and his finished work on the cross. Father, may may we never forget, may we always keep those pictures, may those pictures always bring us back to the sufficiency of Christ and what he's done on our behalf. Lord, we love you, and we thank you so much. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.